you for attending this talk. My name is Brent Griffin. This work is done in collaboration with Victoria Florence and Jason Corso. And today I'm going to be talking about our work using video object segmentation for visual serial control and mobile robot grasping. So using our method, we show that video object segmentation can be useful for robot perception, that segmentation-based visual serial control can be learned in real time, and that using our method, we can perform mobile grasping using a single RGB camera. So let's talk about the video object segmentation-based controller. With the introduction of data sets like Davis, we've seen the development of many segmentation methods that perform well on real and challenging videos. Our goal is to develop a segmentation-based robot perception and control framework that is reliable in unstructured settings. We looked at a classical visual servo control, and the first part, like any feedback controller, is an error, and this is based on the difference between an image feature and its desired position. Now, in classical visual servo control literature, you'll find that they use a lot of fiducial marker-based image features, the nice thing about this work is by using segmentation, robots can visual servo using ordinary real world objects. The next part of our visual servo uh, controller is minimizing errors using control inputs. Our goal was to learn a visual servo control policy in real time automatically, but this wasn't possible using previous methods. So we developed our own Hardeman Broiden update formulation, and this allowed us to learn visual servo control policy in real time without any fiducial markers or calibration. So in this example, you see our robot learning to center on the segmented object within 14 time steps. And as a comparison, when we use the original update, the robot crashes backward into the wall. Using our update formulation, uh, we successfully learned seven different visual serial control policies across seven actuators and two cameras. And one unexpected consequence of this was we were able to track dynamic objects. So here you see our robot tracking a person moving throughout the room. And we can see a lot of different human-robot collaboration um, work that could benefit from this framework. So last thing I'm going to talk about is mobile robot grasping and other ways that we use segmentation. So here you're going to see our robot. It's going to first locate and then center on the sugar box. And then it's going to approach the object and collect segmentations at known camera positions. And it's going to use these to estimate the object's depth. So we do this using changes in segmentation area at relative changes in camera position. And once this estimate of where the object is converges, then the object's location is known. And we can use segmentation again to determine a suitable grasp location. And we even use segmentation to determine that the grasp was successful uh, performing a visual check. The last example that you'll see is our HSR robot moving throughout a room, picking up uh, scattered objects. And I emphasize again that all of the grasping and perception is using a single uh, RGB camera, the grass camera. If you're interested in using this for your own work, please visit the GitHub page at the address shown here. And if you'd like to learn more, uh, please come talk to us during the poster session. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ho Chang Seok. It is my honor to present our work, Robots Feature Tracking in DVS Event Stream Using Badger Mapping. In this work, we address this the novel feature tracking method using only the event stream. We propose the event patch alignment method for short-term tracking and the temporal update method for the long-term tracking. For the short-term tracking, we parameterize the trajectory of events with a Bayesian curve. Then we align the events to the patch to maximize the variance. By doing this, we can associate the events and estimate the trajectory of features simultaneously. We process the long-term tracking using the temporally updated template patch. In this step, we first align the current events to the template with variance maximization, similar to the previous step. After that, we update the template again and use it for the next time. In this experiment, we show that our method aligns the events better than the others, both quantitative and qualitative ways. For the template update experiment, the well-structured patches are constructed by using our method, while it is not consistent without using it. According to the quantitative research in the synthetic dataset, our methods are performance that of juice in both error and tracking length. This is the quantitative result table in the real data sets and our methods show similar or slightly better performance. 
This is the example of qualitative results and the graph shows that the comparison of hours and juice method. We apply our methods to the camera pose estimation problem and our methods shows better performance in terms of accuracy and the number of inliers. Finally, you can see the comparison result in the video. Thank you for Did you have to press something? Yeah. Very cool. Oh. Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan. I'm here to talk to you about object orientation estimation without annotation for symmetrical objects. So in this work we're interested in pose estimation, which we want to know where an object is in the, the 3D world with respect to a fixed point, so the translation of the object and the rotation of the object. And then what we would like to do is find a pose for these objects. So it, this has been approached differently in the literature. On the left-hand side, you have an autoencoder using the code, and then a dictionary, you can sort of retrieve the pose of the object. On the right-hand side, you could directly regress to the pose. Uh, in our work, we want to look at uh, objects that have symmetries. So for example, at the top, you have an object that has symmetries in its 3D model and also in its texture, right? So this is two faces, they have, they're very similar in the middle, same thing, but you have a texture that is different, so the pose will look differently. Uh, and then at the bottom, you have symmetries in the 3D model, but no symmetries on the texture, but visually they look very, very similar. So what we would like to do is to leverage that visual information and then be able to learn from that visual cue uh, the symmetries for the poses. So this is our system, we have a generator that takes as input uh, an image and then it regresses to a pose and then finds that pose, we're gonna render that pose and then we're gonna send that input from the generator and the render pose to a discriminator which is gonna say are these two poses visually similar or not? And then uh, it's gonna assign it a score. Using that score we're gonna go back to the generator and we're gonna train it. But then here we have a renderer and the renderer is uh, undifferentiable. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna sample multiple poses around the generator's output in order to get a lot of signal. And then given that signal, we're gonna use the maximum one that scored the highest as a, target, or as a target to training. So that sort of allows us to get around the problem of having undifferentiable uh, rendering. And then following that, hopefully soon, uh, we have here an example, it's, we have a square, so this is in plane rotation. The square could be represented by four values to represent the same pose visually. Uh, on the middle, uh, it's not super easy to read, but on the middle we have the generator's output. So if you give it any input, it's gonna regress to these, these values within the sort of the boundary in the middle. Sort of showing that it's always like expressing uh, visually the same pose. And then the, on the right hand side is the more complicated one which is the discriminator's output where you vary the both poses and that gives you the score where the lowest means that they're visually similar and the highest means it's low similarity. I'm happy to answer questions. I'll be at poster 23. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Vignesh Ramanathan and I'm from the Indian Institute of Science. I'm here today to present our work, QuickSAL. When we look at these images, we pay attention to different objects in them. The perceptual quality of an object to stand out amongst its neighbors is known as visual saliency. So there exist methods to bottom up visual saliency, but these methods result in models that are large in size and not suitable for use in edge devices. So we propose a solution, QuickSAL. This is our network architecture which is similar to the unit. The bottleneck blocks from the encoder and are pretrained on the image net and the inception blocks from the decoder part of the network. We'll be discussing the building blocks of a model now. So here we have a standard convolution against a depthwise separable. The depthwise separable convolution consists of a depthwise convolution where a single filter is applied to each input channel. 
and this is followed by a one cross one convolution which linearly combines the output of the depthwise separable. So using a depthwise separable in place of a standard convolution gives us a computational advantage of one by dj plus one by k square. So we are using depthwise separable convolutions in our uh, model. Next we have the bottleneck inverted residues. Uh, the linear bottlenecks are used to embed the activations to a lower dimensional subspace. So this provided the hardware uh, design is efficient. This means that we have gains in terms of power and area. The expansion layers are there for the application of nonlinearities, and we're using the relo nonlinearity as it is uh, much more power friendly. Next we have the inception block with deep residues. Uh, we're using dilated convolutions to capture information across different scales. So dilated convolutions can capture, uh, cover different scales with the same parameter count, and they, are help, they help us improve our saliency mass. So the implementation of this block is similar to the previous one. We are using an iterative pruning strategy to induce network sparsity. This ensures lesser memory requirement and also improvement in terms of power usage, as memory fetches much more power hungry than a compute. Next, we have the accuracy versus pruning ratio plots. We can see that our model performance is remaining constant for multiple levels of pruning. Yeah. And uh, here we compare our model size uh, uh, against uh, with selective levels of pruning against other methods. We can see that our uh, quicksal method is many fold smaller than other approaches. However, when we look at the quantitative results, we see that our model, though small, is able to achieve competitive performance to other state-of-the-art approaches. Uh, we are able to achieve top two performance in two out of the four benchmark data sets. Here we have some qualitative results of our model, uh, with uh, row two showing the ground truth and uh, row three showing our model output. So our model is able to perform well across different settings, such as low contrast, uh, shadows, and camouflage. And to summarize, uh, we have a small and sparse architecture for visual saliency. And this model uh, is built to be uh, built to have gains in terms of computation, memory, and power, and uh, it is able to perform, uh, able to achieve competitive performance to other uh, state-of-the-art approaches. Please do visit us at our poster at 24. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Sham Gopal Karthik from IIIT Hyderabad. I will be presenting Mono Layout, a model scene layout from a single image on behalf of the authors Kaustub Mani, Swapnil Daga, Shibika Garg, Shai Shankar Narasimhan, Krishna Murthy, and Madhav Krishna from the Robotics Research Center at IIIT, IIT Kharagpur, and the Montreal Institute of Learning Algorithms. Uh, so the motivation for uh, this problem is that a, uh, a model scene, ca uh, uh, scene completion can be used in uh, multi-object tracking, trajectory prediction, behavior planning, as well as SLAM. Uh, so by a model we mean that the entire top view map is being recovered from only a partial view of the scene. In essence, we have to hallucinate uh, portions of the scene that are not visible from the front view Im image. Uh, our approach is essentially very simple. We have a single encoder and two decoders. For the encoder, we use a ResNet 18 backbone. We have two decoders, one for static, lay uh, static layout estimation, which is the road and the sidewalk. The dynamic obstacle, uh, dynamic encoder is for the vehicles, and the, the, uh, these are trained adversarially. Our, our, we'll show our results now. Uh, so we uh, this uh, method outperforms uh, prior methods on uh, uh, multiple benchmarks and for both static as well as a dynamic layout estimation. Uh, if you look at the runtime, uh, the mono layout uses fewer parameters as well as achieves real-time performance uh, compared to previous methods which uh, use more parameters and are uh, not close to being real-time. Uh, here are some qualitative examples for static layout uh, estimation. Uh, as you can see, our, our results are much better compared to prior methods and closer to the very close to the ground truth. And uh, similarly, we have results for uh, dynamic layout estimation. Uh, now we'll show the results on some uh, on the Agroverse data set. Uh, please note that there was no temporal information that was used. Essentially, we treat each image individually and obtain the layout estimation for each image separately. And uh, similarly, we have results for the KT odometry data set. Here as well, uh, here the uh, decoder was not uh, fine-tuned on the KT odometry data set. And uh, as mentioned before, uh, temporal information was not used. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Please visit, visit the poster at number 25 for more details. Oh, hello, everyone. I'm Jimmy Shen, and I'm from the City University of New York. And today, I'd like to give a presentation about a 3D object detection system based on RGBD image or depth image. And the system's name is called the Frustum Voxel Knight. It's as I suggested, actually, it is 2D driven 3D object detection. And firstly, we have the 2D detector. And from the 2D detector, we further developed a 3D detector. And for the 2D detector, and if you can see, actually, we have two images. One is RGB image, and the right part is actually the image converted from depths. After we, we detect a 2D bounding box, we can crop a subspace from the whole 3D space. We call that part is a first term. Then from the first term, we can voxelize a subspace, then to input to the 3D detection pipeline and to finalize the 3D object detection. It takes ban ban the adv uh, advantage of the 2D detector and the 3D det the, the accuracy of 3D data. So that's why actually the system can run pretty fast. And 2D detector, it is based on the feature pyramid network and it is pre-trained based on the Coco data side, then fine tunes based on the sun RGBD data side. And also 3D detection, 2D detection is evaluated based on the sun RGBD data side. And after we have 2D detector bounding box, actually we can generate a, a first term from the 3D data. 3D is, uh, data is actually converted from the depth image to the, to the cloud pond. And then, then we can try to voxelize a subspace. In order to know how to voxelize subspace, we should know the physical center of the subspace and also the physical size of the subspace. For the center, we can calculate it from the, roughly from the center of the first term. And for the physical size, in order to uh, choose a reasonable physic physical size, we introduced the IOI, a new indicator, to help us to decide what kind of physical size is reasonable to choose. Then, if the physical size is well chosen, we can guarantee the resolution of the voxel image then to support the uh, high performance 3D detection. For the 3D detector, it is a 3D convolutional neural network based on ResNet, ResNet, and it only has six layers. That's why it is kind of faster. And for the results, for 2D detection, it is pretty good. And the performance is pretty good for the some RGBD data, data side. And for the 3D detection, and the detection performance can achieve about 90% of the state of the art, but our inference speed is pretty faster. It is as far as I know, it is kind of the fastest, fastest uh, system for the 3D uh, for based on this data side, and it can it can achieve about 20 frames per second, and that will well support the real-time you know, detection requirements, for the, especially for the indoor robotic navigation. And here we can also see uh, several examples, uh, actually one, one examples. One is from the RGBD image, and another one is from the depth image. We can see the, the depth image, uh, the 3D detection based on the on depth image, is, uh, it, it performs pretty good. Uh, that's it, thank you so much, and the poster is uh, 26, if you're interested in it. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Song Wenfeng. My paper is Cross-View Contextual Relation Transfer Network for Unsupervised Vehicle Tracking in Drone Videos. Drone wheel videos can capture less scale scene information more efficiently and conveniently than the ground wheel ones. However, when we do the drone wheel tracking, we met the following two challenges. First, the drone wheel videos unavoidably leads to large changes of vehicle appearances. Secondly, the common obstacle for the deep learning method is the heavy dependence on a large amount of labeled data. To solve the challenges, we propose the following motivations. Firstly, we propose to efficiently model the contextual relation as a relevance between the target and its contextual regions. Secondly, we propose a dual generative adversary learning mechanism to transfer the contextual relations across fields. Finally, we propose a unified contextual relation actor creative framework to seamlessly integrate the dynamic context search with the dual GAN transfer. This is a pipeline of our CRSA. It includes two components. The first one is contextual relation search. The second one is cross-view contextual relation transfer. The first one is implemented by an actor-critical network. 
the drawing videos at the input of the network within the actor critical agent. The contact search network outputs cost contact readings for the tracking network, and the contact critical network evaluates the actions action sets and feeds the Q-value by to iteratively improve possible actions. Within the tracking network, the improved context is used to generate ground view samples from UAV uh, for UAV adaption, and the AGAN refines critical regions via attention maps. This is the performance comparisons with the state of the art methods in hard challenging cases such as aspect ratio change, camera motion, and so on. The compare with high performance methods, RCRAC has the highest speed. Thank you for listening. If you have some questions, Please drop me an email. Hello, everyone. I'm Jinu. I'm going to talk about domain adaptation for action recognition from drones. Drone catchers' videos are popular these days. They can be used for sports analytics, extreme sports, crime detection, and disaster monitoring. To study this interesting problem, we collected a new data set consists of 5,000 videos. So what are the challenges? First, continuous motion in drone videos. And due to the motion, there are severe motion blurs. Also, viewpoints are rare. Finally, it's expensive to annotate videos. Thus, we formulate the problem as domain adaptation, where we have label source and all label target data. And we can also assume few labels from target are available. During training, we employ a standard action classification pipeline for label source videos. Then we employ an adversarial domain classifier to align source and target features. When we have a few tar target uh, label uh, videos, we use cross-entropy loss for them. We also employ instance-based domain adaptation as instance features are easier to align. During testing, we fuse the video and instance level predictions to get final prediction scores. The source-only baseline shows 13% accuracy. Video-based domain adaptation doubles the performance instance-based adaptation, and the combination of two further improved performance. We also show the upper bound as a reference. We explore a more practical situation where the source and target labor sets are disjoint. In this case, instead of using cross-entropy, we formulate the problem as metric learning and we employ triplet loss in the embedding space. To align the source and target features, we employ adversarial loss, and during testing, we need a support set, which means few target labeled uh, examples per class, and we, we perform k nearest neighbor. Source only baseline shows 8% accuracy. Video based domain adaptation improves performance more than double. Instance based and the combination further improve performance. Contributions. We collected a new data set to study the action recognition from drones. We introduced challenging domain adaptation problems for action recognition from drones, which are unsupervised and semi-supervised settings, and the same and disjoint label set settings. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Amelie and I'm going to talk about a drone project with my PhD advisor, which is on efficient object detection for aerial images. So our initial motivation is the fact that different object detection tasks have very specific requirements and constraints. For instance, state-of-the-art detectors are often trained for exhaustivity. So they are trained on data sets which have very densely distributed objects of medium size, and the key challenge is to model the different visual appearance of different semantic classes. 
On the other hand, aerial images, like for instance images from drones, often have very small objects, which are spatially split over the image. And another constraint is that we have computational constraints because we want to run on embedded devices such as drones. One problem is that applying state-of-the-art detectors directly on these kind of distributions can lead to wasted computations. And one reason for that is that we just allocate as much compute resources to the empty regions of the image than to the relevant ones. So we wanted to basically address this problem by improving the trade-off between the detection accuracy and the computational efficiency of the model. To do that, we propose a new detection pipeline called OTGI. And the idea that we have a multi-stage detection pipeline where each stage can either predict individual objects or regions to be refined by subsequent stage. So it's a multi-exit pipeline because each stage can just decide to detect individual objects and propagate them to the output. And the key point is how do we define this region that we want to refine? Because for functional efficiency, we only want to detect a few relevant regions. And to do that, we decide to use uh, natural group structures present in the image. And the question is how would we define what is a group of objects because we usually do not have this kind of supervision in most data sets. So what we decide to do is to define groups of objects in a self-supervised manner. So we use backbone detectors which have a fully conventional architecture. And what we have as an intuitive definition is that taking the output feature map, if in one cell we have only one object, then we just define this object as the target for the prediction task, such as we would do for a standard detector. However, if we have multiple objects in one cell, then we decide to take the group of them by taking the union of their bonding boxes, and we use this union as a new target for the predictor in that cell. So this allows us to just train the model quite efficiently. And then we just do several experiments with different aerial view data sets and different backbone detectors. So we evaluate each model in terms of the detection accuracy, so average precision, and in terms of computational efficiency by the runtime. And we observe that the proposed pipeline usually propose a better trade-off between the detection performance and the computational efficiency on the model, and this holds for several input resolutions. So here I just wanted to show you some qualitative experiments. And if you want to hear more, you can visit our poster, which is poster number 29. And thank you for your attention. Hi, I'm Ahana. I am a PhD student at Florida State University, and today I'll be presenting our work on reconstructing road network graphs from both aerial images and LIDAR. So why do we want to develop uh, an automatic method for road network uh, extraction? It's, road networks are important for transportation, urban planning, mapping, as well as for self-driving cars. We could have chosen to use GPS traces for our project here, but GPS traces raise concerns about the use of personal data, as well as the fact that GPS traces are not uniform in all places. As a result, in places that have lower density of GPS traces, such as rural areas, the accuracy would have been affected. So we use a data set consisting of aerial images and LIDAR. And these can be obtained cheaply at present and uh, easily and do not suffer from the drawbacks that GPS traces suffer from. We want to develop a road extraction pipeline which gives us as the output a road network consisting of nodes and edges. Our road extraction pipeline consists of aerial images and LiDAR data being used to perform segmentation of images. The first part is a CNN pipeline, which performs segmentation of images into road and non-road pixels. And then we have the road extractor, which takes the segmented images as its outputs and performs the, as its inputs and performs the final uh, road network extraction. The road uh, segmentation architecture that you see here consists of three instances of the DeepLab V3 Plus architecture. The third instance of the DeepLab V3 Plus architecture takes as the inputs the outputs of the first two instances. And the final output we have is the segmented images. Once we get the segmented images, then we perform a graph, a road graph extraction where we uh, obtain a preliminary graph by performing disk packing. We use the road pixels and uh, drop disks onto these road pixels and then get our preliminary road extraction graph by connecting the centers of the intersecting disks. Our road extraction is not perfect or the preliminary graph is not perfect due to, in the, due to imperfect segmentation and we use curve reconstruction to handle the connectivity issues that we have. For degree zero nodes, we 
connect those to the nearest neighbors which lie within a specific distance and for degree one nodes we connect those to the nearest neighbor in the opposite half space we do this in order to ensure that the directionality of the roads is maintained in in case of degree one nodes and in the experimental results, we see that our method performs better in terms of connectivity when compared to road tracer, whereas when we compare to deep road mapper or thinning based techniques, we are better at handling out, uh, outlier detection. And uh, if you have further questions, please visit us at poster number 30. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth Bondi. I am a fourth year PhD candidate at Harvard University advised by Milan Tambe. Today I'll be presenting some work done with our great collaborators at IIIT Delhi, uh, Air Shepherd, Microsoft, and USC. And it's about a data set called Bird's Eye, which has aerial thermal infrared videos. So our main motivation behind uh, assembling this data set comes from wildlife conservation, and in particular trying to prevent illegal wildlife poaching. So just to give you an idea of the, uh, the threat, uh, according to the WWF, in 2007, 13 rhinos in South Africa were killed, and it has expanded to, in 2013 to over 1,000 rhinos. So to try to prevent wildlife poaching from occurring, our collaborators at Air Shepherd are flying conservation drones over national parks uh, to try to prevent the wildlife poaching from occurring. So they do this by flying these drones over these national parks at nighttime when poaching typically occurs. And because it's at night, they use thermal infrared videos, which are then streamed in real time to base stations where park rangers can then monitor these videos all night long so that if they see a threat, they can notify a park ranger who can then go uh, investigate and hopefully prevent wildlife poaching from occurring in the first place. So obviously, it sounds pretty tedious to have to watch these videos all night long. So our goal was to try to ease the burden on these park rangers who are monitoring these videos by just giving them an alert if we detect something. So to try to do this automatically, uh, our first step was assembling this data set. So if you look at our videos, um, we have frames from left to right containing uh, humans. We have lions, another human two humans that are pretty small uh, next to a vehicle, and then we have another giraffe and a group of elephants. Uh, so you can see from these videos that it's, it's pretty challenging to try to automatically detect um, or do tracking in these videos because our objects of interest are quite small and also uh, because we have low resolution and, uh, of course, the single band from thermal infrared images. So we have 62,000 of these real frames that were taken by Air Shepherd in the field, and they're labeled for object detection tracking. And we also have created our simulated data set using Microsoft AirSim, uh, and in particular their Africa environment and an infrared model, which we developed in previous work. And so altogether, uh, we perform benchmarking on all of these different tasks. And we hope that this will inspire research in all of these areas and also uh, for the purposes of this real world application, which can hopefully save animals. So if you're interested, please check out our website where the data set is hosted and, and visit me at my poster 31. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name's Ye. I'm presenting our work, Periphery Fulvia Multi-Resolution Driving Model guided by human attention. Humans has distinct peripheral vision and fulvial vision. Our peripheral vision covers most of the visual field but has low resolution. Our fulvial vision is localized but has high resolution. Inspired by human vision, we propose our deep driving model. Our peripheral visual encoder uses a very low input resolution so that it can efficiently process the long range scene structures. Another human attention prediction module also operates on the low resolution input to predict where human drivers will look. And this module is separately trained with human driver eye movement data. High resolution image patches are cropped out from the predicted uh, seating regions and are then processed by our fulvial visual encoder. And finally, the output feature maps of the two encoders are concatenated together to predict the speed of the vehicle. 
We tested our multi-resolution model against a uni-resolution model that has the same total number of flops. We used test videos of different lengths, and our multi-resolution model consistently outperforms the uni-resolution model. This result demonstrates the effectiveness and high efficiency of our model. Moreover, when we divided uh, the test cases into pedestrian-involved situations and other general situations, our model compared with the no-phobia model, our model not only show performance gain in the general situations, but also show even greater gain in the critical situations that involve pedestrians. I'm going to show you one example in video format. These bars are showing the ground truth speed, the speeds predicted by our model and by another no-phobia control model. The high resolution regions are the regions se uh, selected by our foveal uh, module. You can see at this moment, our foveal module has already picked up the traffic light and the crosswalk. As the video goes, the high resolution patches move around. That shows how our foveal visual uh, module scans across city regions. This moment, our model is looking at the uh, crossing pedestrian and the traffic light and success successfully predicts the slowdown while the control model still predicts to go at full speed. And you will see our model consistently look at the uh, important pedestrian and the traffic light. To summarize, our model has a low resolution peripheral module and a high resolution foveal module. It achieves better driving accuracy and higher efficiency, and it is robust to critical situations. Our work, it, uh, the code is already available on GitHub. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, I'm Satish and I'm presenting our work on deep remote sensing method for methane detection in airborne hyperspectral imagery. So the image you are seeing on the screen now, right now came out last year in New York Times. Everything seems normal to your human eye, but looking through an infrared eye, there is a large amount of methane gas leaking through that chimney. So why would anyone need to worry about it? Methane gas is a major contributor in global climate change. Though the gas is short-lived, it lasts only for a decade, unlike carbon dioxide that persists for a century, but it's 85 times more potent at heat trapping as compared to CO2. So you can imagine the amount of damage meth uh, CO2 will do in a century, methane can do that in one and a half years only. So where is this gas coming from? It comes from dairy farms, oil and natural gas refineries, and landfill sites. Just in California, there are thousands of oil and natural gas refineries, hundreds of landfill sites, and dairy farms. This needs attention now. Because of lack of monitoring methods, the biggest natural gas leakage in the history happened in Los Angeles in the Ellison Canyon, and it remained undetected for four months. So to monitor and find out such, such leakages, NASA JPL collected hyperspectral data for potential emission sites. Our objective is to find out the methane emission site and make a mask of the gas plume as shown in the right image. So in the right-hand side, the red shoe sees a segmentation of the mass where the gas is spread. And the left-hand side is the deck of slides is actually a representation of hyperspectral image, where each slide represents the radiance values which are captured, captured at that particular wavelength. So there are current solutions to the problem, but suspense. <laughs> They're very slow. And they need a human expert uh, to pinpoint the leakage sources. And they're highly prone to potential confusers also. So we propose a deep neural network detector to automate and enhance plume detection, plume delineation, and region concentration. So it is an end-to-end -end pipeline that takes in a raw hyperspectral image and outputs a binary mask of the methane plume over that region. You can see at the end. And so our, our algorithm reduces the total computation time by a factor of 12 and also closely matches the ground truth with an accuracy of 87%. So the ones you see on the right-hand side is a prediction, and the left-hand side is a ground truth. The method, method is highly scalable, because a human being can't be, like you can't hire 100 people. So these are some more sample results. For more details, please visit our poster number 34. Thank you. All right, I'm Adam Van Etten. Uh, let's talk about roads and satellites. So why, why do they care about this? Um, well, in disaster response scenarios, uh, for example, 
the existing techniques that you could use, like Google Maps, uh, might not work because um, the roads are damaged and cell, cell towers are down. Uh, and current techniques um, that are in, in literature might not help you because all you get is either pixels or you get just the, the road geometry. You don't get any um, features of the map. Optimal routing is usually a feature of time, right, not just distance. And so the goal is to try and get um, a, road, a road network with actual time estimates um, for each, each road segment so we can do actual optimized routing. This is something that would be very helpful for this example of this disaster response uh, type of scenario. The data we use for this, uh, we use a SpaceNet data set, so it's four cities, 8,000 kilometers of hand labeled roads. Um, we take these, these image chips, a label, uh, uh, render them into a binary road mask, right? This is what you typically do. We go one step further and make a multi-class mask based on the road um, speed estimate. And this is what we use to train our, our model. Um, and for the actual model, uh, what, we, what we do is, here we go, uh, we, we input the image chips into the model, we get out the segmentation mask, um, there's a, a bunch of post-processing I won't go into, um, but you can get a road network out of this, right? Um, but then we use this multi-class nature uh, of this mask um, to pull out the road speed, right? Which of course, then if you have the distance, you can get the travel time. Um, so this is how we build up this network. Um, this is something that's actually quite rapid, um, but as you might imagine, right, this doesn't scale terribly well. Um, you can't shove an entire satellite image chip into a deep learning model. These images are often mini gigapixels. Um, and so to scale this out, um, we use some fairly simple technique um, with some overlap because you need these connections at the edges. Um, and at the end of the day, what you get is a city scale uh, road network with these speed estimates uh, for each roadway. So how does this do? Um, on the left is road tracer, which is one of the more popular methods. Um, on the right is our method um, for the same region. You can see we're doing a lot better job of, of connecting roads and not having spurious connections like in the water on the left. Um, this is just dist distance based. If you look at the time aspect, there's nothing to compare it to, but um, things look pre pretty good, right? So this is an image of Shanghai at large scale. We've colored here by speed, so red is, is uh, faster, yellow is slower. Doing a pretty good job of pulling this out. There's only about a 4% error in speed estimation. Um, I can go to that more at the poster if you guys care about what that really means. Here's Las Vegas, an easier city. If we build up the network um, for speed, this is what we see, right? Um, yellow is slower, uh, red is faster. And this is the actual router network we've predicted from the imagery. Um, if you care uh, to learn more, uh, the poster is actually 35, not 770. Um, codes up um, or the archive paper. Thank you. Hi, my name is Vishnu Sarake, and my collaborators are Anirudh Jain, Burak Uskin, and Stevno Irman. And today we're presenting our paper, Cloud Removal in Satellite Images Using Spatiotemporal Generative Networks. So satellite images are uh, used for a variety of critical applications. For instance, uh, crop classification, environmental monitoring, urban mapping, and more. But cloud occlusions make images really unusable, and over two-thirds of the world is covered at any point in time with clouds. So what can we do to make these images usable? So our solution to the problem is to frame cloud removal as a conditional image synthesis problem. And in this case, um, we create a mapping from several input cloudy images to single cloud-free images, leveraging both spatial and temporal information. And so we create a data set by taking several consecutive satellite passes over the same region, where um, several passes could have cloudy images and then the next pass could have a clear image. Uh, and under the assumption that the ground is not changing very much in this short period of time, we can create pairs of several cloudy images to a single clear image. With Sentinel-2 data, we have a large scale data set comprised of uh, all continents around the globe. And um, in this data set with 100,000 images, it's by far the largest of its kind. Next, we model, we have a, a novel model called, we call a spatiotemporal GAN to encode and decode features from each of the individual input cloudy images. And we integrate these features together to produce a single cloud-free image that uh, captures the best parts of each of the input images and deduces parts that are not easily visible. Our quantitative results show that we well outperform the state of the art both on uh, single image approaches and on uh, conventional multiple image approaches. 
uh, we avoid all sorts of um, failures that occur with temporal composites, which do not work well on very few images. And here are some of our qualitative results. You can see that in the first three um, columns, you have your input images. The fourth column is the image produced by our model. And the final column is the real uh, true ground truth. And you can see that we preserve um, both like high level features and some uh, fine details as well. And uh, here's a look at a few more images as well. So we're kind of displaying performance across a variety of terrains. In terms of applications, we actually tested downstream performance on uh, crop classification. And this worked much better when we were using our uh, cloud occlusion uh, removal pipeline. And other applications include disaster monitoring um, and um, crop yield prediction. Thank you. Please come check out our poster number 36. Hello, everyone. I'm Binghui Huang from Tsinghua University. Here, I will give a short introduction about our work, single satellite optical imagery dehazing using SAR image Fourier, based on conditional generative adversarial network, which is joined with Zhili, Chaoyang, Fu Chunsun, and Yi Xu Song. Satellite image dehazing aims at precisely retrieving the real situations of the obscured parts from the hazy remote sensing RIS images. The multi-sensor data fusion is significant to provide extra information. Set his 1K is established and composed of 1,200 pairs of clear synthetic aperture radar SA, hazy RGB, and corresponding ground truth images. Based on the data site, we propose a novel fusion dehazing model to directly restore the haze-free remote sensing images by using an end-to-end -end conditional generative adversarial network, CGAN. The data site consists of 1,200 image pairs, which are split into three levels of fog, called thin fog, moderate fog, and thick fog. More details of the data site can be found in the persistent link. We split every 400 images to tree, valid, and test set, and artificially label 45 of the thick fog images for segmentation purpose. Our generator is composed of two modules, the encoder-decoder network and the SAR information highway. We also utilize the GAPE connections to fill multi-scale information. Furthermore, we adopt the handmade design dilated residual blocks, which expands the receptive fields significantly and avoid gradient vanishing effectively. We adopt the patch gun as our discriminator network, so we automate it here. Comparing with other baselines, such as DCP, the Haze Knight and SAR based baselines. Our method can achieve better performance. Our experience also indicates that the SAR based methods perform better in the segmentation tasks. SAR based baselines can attain consistent improvements, and our algorithm has a strong generalization ability to handle different fog situations. More experience could be found in our paper and website. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> so my name is Jordan Mayloff, an assistant research professor at Duke University, and I will share our team's work on Sentinel-1, a collection of synthetic overhead imagery for training building segmentation models. In building segmentation, we wish to obtain pixel-wise labels of the buildings that are visible in overhead imagery, such as those shown here. Recently, deep learning models have produced impressive results for building segmentation, as illustrated here by our own recent winning results on the Enria benchmark. However, when we apply our trained models to geographic locations that aren't present in the training data set, performance can drop substantially. This is because overhead imagery can vary tremendously due to scene content, lighting conditions, and many other factors, as illustrated with the real-world imagery shown here. Unfortunately, modern models do not generalize well across these variations. We could collect training imagery that captures all of this real-world variability, allowing us to train more robust models, but this is completely infeasible due to the extremely high cost of purchasing and annotating such imagery. In this work, 
suspend. In this work, we propose to overcome this problem by generating synthetic overhead imagery. We use a widely available software called City Engine, which allows us to create large-scale virtual worlds that are constrained to be realistic while still allowing us to add in many important sources of variability. Once our virtual world is created, we use Python code to automatically capture overhead photographs of our virtual worlds and the ground truth labels. Using these techniques, we created a collection of high-resolution overhead imagery encompassing nine highly diverse city styles, which we termed Sentinel-1. To test the effectiveness of Sentinel-1, we first trained a popular segmentation model, the UNET, on a large building segmentation benchmark called NREA. We then tested our model blindly on another large benchmark called DPLOBE, or DG for short, that encompasses completely different geographic regions. The results of this in terms of intersection over union are shown in the table on the right. We then repeated this experiment, but this time adding Sentinel-1 to the training data set, which resulted in large performance improvements, as indicated by the percentage increase in performance shown on the right on the table. We repeated these experiments again, but training on NREA and testing on DeepLobe, and again found Sentinel-1 as beneficial. We then repeated all four of these experiments, but using DeepLab V3, another segmentation model, and found similarly positive results. This suggests Sentinel-1 is consistently beneficial. In the paper, we also show additional benchmark testing as well as analyses of why Sentinel-1 is beneficial. We believe there is tremendous future potential for the techniques proposed here. For little cost, it is possible to add more variability and richness to the synthetic imagery to further improve results, as well as applying domain stylization or adaptation techniques, which we did not consider here yet. It is also possible to expand the ground truth to include pixel-wise labels for many more classes of objects, their heights, and possibly even their material compositions. To support future work, we have publicly released Sentinel-1 and the code to generate it so that others may use this technique as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chris Ye, and today I will talk about efficient object detection in large images using deep reinforcement learning, a project I did with Barack Uskent and Stefano Ehrman at Stanford. So object detection on large images is costly, both in terms of memory requirements and time. To get around this, we can downsample an image, which removes the memory bottleneck, but this may reduce accuracy. Or we can use the sliding window technique, running a detector on each window in the image. However, this significantly increases runtime. Instead, what we propose is essentially an adaptive sliding window. Large objects are often already detectable from a downsampled image. Thus, we only sample high-resolution image patches where necessary, such as where there are many small objects. In our setup, we assume that we have a low-resolution image to begin with, and that high-resolution parts of the image can be acquired, but at additional cost. We start by defining small patches within the image. We then pass the entire low-resolution image through a convolutional neural network that we call a policy network, which outputs a binary-valued action array indicating whether or not to acquire the high-resolution image uh, version of that image patch. Because the sampling procedure is discrete, we use reinforcement learning methods to train the policy network. Specifically, we define a reward function that assigns high cost uh, to sampling a high-resolution image patch if it does not provide a significant increase in accuracy over using a low-resolution patch. And we weight the cost by the number of actual images, uh, actual objects in the image. So as shown earlier, the policy network effectively treats sampling each image patch as a Bernoulli random variable. The network is then trained using the policy gradient method to minimize the expected cost with an advantage function to reduce variance. We tested our method on two real-world data sets. Um, the XView dataset consists of large satellite images, and we considered the setting when there is a 5x difference uh, in resolution between the low and high resolution images. Compared to always using high resolution patches, we can cut runtime in half by using only about a third of the high resolution patches with similar average precision and recall. We also outperform previous state of the art methods. So in the images on the right, uh, you, uh, shows the policy learned by the policy network. Um, in the first column, there is a large object, so the policy network only uses the low-resolution image. The second column has many small buildings, so the policy network requests all high-resolution image patches, um, and similarly for the third. And we also um, tested our method on the... <laughs> also tested our method on the Caltech pedestrian data set. Here, at a 2x downsampling ratio, we only need about 6.6% of the high-resolution image patches to maintain very high accuracy, which significantly reduces runtime and acquisition costs. So in summary, our reinforcement learning method pushes the Pareto frontier for the runtime accuracy trade-off in object detection. 
So please stop by our poster for more details and check out our code on GitHub. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Bajahat Kazmi from Keep Track in R&D, Lahore, Pakistan, and here I'm to present my team's work on lane detection using lane boundary marker network under road geometry constraints. <clears throat> the problem with current lane detection algorithms is that they suffer from the problem of occlusion and struggle to detect lane lines with poor or no evidence on the road. We exploit road geometry in a deep paradigm to address this using priors of uh, constant uh, lane width and lane parallelisms. So we start with a lane boundary marker network which samples uh, lines to key points and uh, uh, detects the key points instead of lines on the road. And then following that, we fit uh, lines to the key points to estimate lanes. Now few lanes would be missing and some are detected. Um, in order to estimate, uh, of, uh, uh, in the next step, we find uh, inverse perspective mapping for which we need a horizon. Uh, for horizon, we need a vanishing points, at least two vanishing points, a forward and a lateral vanishing point. A forward vanishing point can be found by cross uh, product of uh, two world parallel lines, and a lateral vanishing point can be found by uh, cross ratios of world parallel lines that we can discuss. Uh, once the, the uh, horizon is estimated, we can find the inverse perspective mapping, and then we can estimate, uh, initialize a lane width that will be used to predict the missing lanes which have poor or no evidence on the road. Uh, now, uh, with these uh, uh, initialized lane width, uh, once we have found two lanes, we can predict any missing lanes, uh, whether there is evidence or not, and then we can uh, uh, go for reciprocal uh, weighted averaging to prune them down, and then we can map them back, and this is how it looks like. We tested our algorithm on three data sets, uh, CU Lane, Caltech, and TU Simple, but here we're only gonna present uh, the results of CU Lane. And these are the results. Uh, the standard uh, state-of-the-art algorithms could not surpass in F1 score uh, from 71 to 73%. However, we are, uh, we are by using our post-processing pipeline, could reach up to 81%. And we even tested uh, with a uh, special CNN, which is a state-of-the-art algorithm, and appended our uh, post-processing pipeline and raised their performance by 9%, which is quite remarkable. And uh, deep learning only methods cannot detect lines with no evidence on the road. Here are some uh, sample uh, results. With uh, On the left top, you can see an image with uh, 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 at night with uh, the evidence is not much visible. And here are some curve scenarios or occlusion uh, uh, scenarios in which there are a lot of vehicles on the road and we, we can see them. Uh, we can discuss more on the poster. It's number 40. Thank you very much. Thank you.